Nice to meet you, everyone. Hi, Zane. Cool. Um, so yeah, before before we get into you know the demo, I think it's probably best to provide some some context on what we're trying to do. Um, and it's this idea of tagging papers. So there's already a way to segregate papers based on hubs, um, and eventually in the future, hopefully sub hubs as well. Um, but the idea behind tags is you know topics that work laterally across these different hubs. So like between biology and chemistry, COVID is a great example. There might be papers that are both focused around the topic of COVID, um, and you want to see all all papers related to COVID, you should be able to filter by some sort of tag. Um, a lot of this, you know, it's still new to, to, to me and, and, and uh, you know, what I'm building. So I'd love your feedback as to what you expect out of tags and what you expect it to look and feel like, but I have a rudimentary demo to show all of you guys. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, looking so the idea is, I mean, this is not final yet, but it'll look something like this. Um, and the, the idea is when you click on one of these tags, um, it'll basically show you a list of all papers associated with that tag, right? So if I if I click fungicidal, um, it'll show me all papers relating to fungus fungicidality, uh, or however you, you pronounce that word. Um, and you can filter through the same way you'd be able to now, like based on papers, post hypotheses, discuss, newest, top, um, that wouldn't change. And then in terms of actually using tags and, and setting them up, when you're uploading a paper or editing a paper, um, it works uh, sort of how you'd expect, similar to Reddit or Stack Overflow, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, you just edit the paper, you write the tag separated by commas, um, so like tag one, tag two, tag three, um, and then you hit save. That's pretty much it. Um, and what I'd like your feedback on, if you guys are open to it, what would you expect um, from from tags in terms of whether it's a preset defined list that that we set up for you guys, um, or is it something that you should be able to add yourselves? Um, because you know, at the same time, we're trying to balance uh, people with malicious intent on the website. So if someone comes on and starts putting profanity in tags, obviously, you know, we want to avoid that if possible. Um, I'll stop here for a second. If anyone has any questions. Ricardo? Yeah, so first of all, thank, thank you very much. Like this is really this is really cool and actually would be really helpful uh, before we implement uh, sub hubs to sort of like find a way to like basically discriminate uh, some papers that are you know, within within the same hub. So right. um, as for how like how uh, basically how to create a tag, like in which way we should be able to, to do it, I think it's it should be like at least at the first stage. Uh, it's probably better if, like, um, let's say within a specific hub, there could be you know some discussion about like uh, some let's say popular tags. Like for example, let's say people of the uh, of a specific hub can like uh, come together and like decide some uh, some tags that are let's say common uh, within the field. Like that right. happens. Uh, you know that 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 happens a lot with like uh, scientific journals. You normally like have within a journal uh, specific tags that, are, that most people use. Uh, so that could be useful to let's say standardize the way in which people uh, tag papers. Because if we give too much freedom, it will be actually difficult to locate uh, specific papers according to the tags. Because maybe just a little difference uh, within tags uh, will create, you know, uh, will be impossible to basically uh, group together some some papers. The other option we're looking at and. and Kind of touches on what you said is is going back through all of the papers in the research hub database and looking the keywords associated with that paper and making that our, our set defined list of tags right so like sometimes in papers at the bottom it'll it'll show you that list of keywords or you know just scrubbing the document looking for which words appear the most you know stuff like that um would, would that make sense at all yeah yeah that could that could definitely help that could definitely help i'm also uh working on a hub stroke structuring and like the the one that passed in uh, rip one uh from the community so uh given that the, there's a like a lot of like granularity in like sub hubs there's like a lot of uh sub subs something that i was thinking about is some of these hubs could actually be replaced by uh tags because there's yeah. not like a lot of uh let's say activity on some hubs like some of them don't, don't even have an editor or there's no papers at all but they could actually be really helpful as uh tags so that could be also something to consider, like having like specific like categories uh, that could be used as tags. Like let's say COVID is not so 
uh, like popular in like three, four years, COVID could, you know, shouldn't be a hub anymore because nobody will actually post in COVID or like not a lot of papers. So it could become like an hashtag. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, and I guess before we get to the next question, uh, I, I have one more for you, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the difference between tags and hubs or do you see them as, as sort of one in the same? So hubs should actually like reflect, let's say, a discipline or a sub discipline. Uh, okay. While tags, like I can make the example of my hub. Like my hub is biosensing, but actually biosensing and biosensors will work way better as tags than hubs because biosensors are multidisciplinary. So it's difficult to actually relate that to a discipline. It will be way better to identify that as a NASH tag. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Edwin? Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if I caught this or not, but when the tags are being introduced, are the editors going to have, are they going to be introduced alongside paper? Uh, I'll let Patrick take that one. I, I think right now the idea is yes, um, but I'm not sure if, if Patrick has different thoughts. Well, uh, in case, go ahead. Just to jump in, did you say that they would be added alongside papers? Well, that's all exactly. Yeah, so I think they could be added um, when you upload a paper, kind of like hubs are added. Um, they could be tweaked after that. We still have to figure out exactly like uh, the permissions for moderation, whether that's like the submitting user or the editors of the hub that it was added within. Um, and, and then we also have the ability to essentially like uh, over time refine a uh, ML algorithm that would be able to automatically extract tags. I know there have been some projects for this before, like that will look through scientific papers and determine essentially like what discipline they fall into. So I think there's probably some stuff that we'd be able to build on top of in order to have like automatic tag recognition. Um, th does that help to answer the question? It does. Um, what I was wondering about was just the malicious uh, part of it, what people could just generate about their tags that are not relevant to the property system. And uh, if the editors have to, you know, sign off on that before they affect the entire system, I would think that that would be a natural process. I'm not sure. I just want to, if there's some other reason to think that may not be the case, I just one Yeah, it's a, it's a great point because it, it, it could definitely be way too time consuming for editors if they have to actually like monitor every single tag on every paper that's added. We, we could have the ability to like flag tags potentially, like if there's like one that, you know, people don't think is appropriate for the given paper. The design space is big here. So um, realistically, we'll probably release like a V1 and just see where it breaks, because I'm sure it will break and there will be some malicious activity. And then once that happens, we'll probably iterate in order to like find a solution to whatever you know bad thing is occurring with the V1. Yeah, that Any other comments on the matter? I saw Lynn had a hand back. Oh, yeah, no, um, it, it, my comments were kind of covered, honestly, but thank you. Cool. Well, well, thanks for the feedback, guys. Uh, I, I do have one more question for everyone. Um, what would you expect out of being able to search by tags? Um, would you want to be able to subfilter by hubs? Uh, would tags belong independently to hubs? So, like, for example, if you're in computer science, um, would you want to be able to, to, to filter by tags within computer science? Or if you filter by a tag, do you expect all results to come and from from all different hubs. Does that question make sense? Anton? Yeah, I think it definitely makes sense to like filter tags within the respective hub. Otherwise, there's probably some overlap between technical terms or something. Right. OK, that makes sense. Well, I think that's it for, for the tag stuff. Um, I appreciate the feedback, everyone. Oh. Malik? I think you're muted, Malik. Sorry. Uh, one quick question. I, I like the filtering idea too, but uh, would it still, like, let's say the tag here was fungicidal, would it still give you like multiple papers from that filter or? Yeah. So, I mean, it depends on, on the scope of the search, right? So, like, if you're only searching within computer science and there's only one tag as fungicidal, it'll only return that paper. Uh, but if you're searching the entirety of research hub for that tag, then any paper in any hub would be returned. 
And so both options will be available. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. And thanks for presenting, Zane. This is a, uh, like, I remember Anton asking for this maybe like 18 months ago. This is like one of the original OG feature requests from the community. So I'm glad we're finally getting around to it. Happy to help, guys. That was a twofold request, actually. Tag in, I guess, has a second meaning of tag in other users in the comments. I, probably is unrelated in terms of how it's coded. Yeah, uh, unrelated, but that's also on the roadmap, too. All right, sounds good. All right, let's move on to the next topic. So we are working on the revising the editor onboarding materials, or I guess for any active users, question mark. And so my question to you would be, if there would be a big place for all the relevant documents and guidelines and examples and such for, you know, hub growth, for a moderation for outreach for the grant agreement and stuff like that what would you like to see in that list in that folder i think as a just a little bit of context here uh, getting like a, a shared notion where um like on the help page right now we kind of have like a, a home page for our notion we could add a category for like community you know documents or community materials and we just have a list of like essentially a running list of all of the like instruction guides or anything new users would need in order to like get onboarded onto research hub and start to help build community uh yeah maybe one question would be why do we not do this in the ELN? Um, like I thought in general, like maybe sharing the editor's material would be cool to do it within the ELN. I don't know how it's with the editing rights. Um, no, we can, we can. Uh, still, I haven't still considered finally what what platform should should be on. I was thinking Notion, but could totally be ELN. In when this first started, it was in the first iteration of the ELN and the sharing options were limited, but we, we could if you want. Yeah, I thought that would be pretty cool. OK, sounds good. Yeah, it depends on what we have to share. Like now we know the ELN is kind of like limited in some terms, like of what we can actually put in the in the page, let's say. But if it's just like a couple images and text, I also think that the ELN is best to keep everything in Research Hub, yeah. I think uh, like one example where the ELN might not work well is uh, Ricardo has been putting together like a pretty cool like a uh, bounty Kanban board where in theory like we'd be able to like list a bunch of uh, RSC bounties for doing community building activities. And so Notion has a little bit of infrastructure when it comes to just like regular project management stuff that our ELN doesn't really uh, support. So yeah, like we can we can do stuff where we can put out like github issues have them import into notion have like bounties associated with them and then pay them out um kind of automatically so we can, we can do more than just documents in notion which is why it might be my preference at the time that's fair anton mm -hmm. yeah maybe one more thing that would come to mind is uh, how to use the referral links properly at large scale I think that would be pretty helpful for editors when they start. Like a referral guideline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more requests? White paper, if it's not already in the list, I have it already on the, on the like that's kind of like. I mean the updated yeah, the, one. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick, do you know if there is uh, if there are any intentions to update the original white paper? Yeah, yeah we need to <clears throat> go over the tokenomics today. And so this is updated as of like last Friday, uh, and it's different than what's in the white paper. So yeah, there's a couple uh, updates we need to make. And also, maybe it can be a separate folder, but uh, all the outreach material, pitch decks, one pagers for like elevator pitch, uh, tutorials for like Twitter posts and Reddit posts, uh, LinkedIn posts, whatever. Yeah, that kind of things. So. 
Good. Okay. I guess if uh, in the future anybody thinks of anything else that should be included in this, um, just DM me, Ricardo, or Anton, and uh, we'll put the wheels in motion in order to get it drafted and throw it into the doc. Yep. All right. Uh, let's move on then. So a few users have suggested we talk about the revised visual visual layout of the home page. What are your thoughts? We have used it for three, four days so far. Is, uh, is Thomas here? Thomas, do you want to screen share just to, to refresh everybody's memory? Uh, oh, OK. Uh, I can do it if, you, if you're not. Uh, sure. Maybe you could do it. I, it'll yeah. Take a long okay. time. Specifically, the person who submitted it uh, wanted to talk about the comment count and the hub list. I forgot who submitted it originally. Yeah, so just to, to kick off the conversation, um, one thing we've been thinking about recently on this homepage is like the different sections, like which ones provide the most value. Um, curious what everybody thinks of the trending hubs here. We're potentially considering replacing this with uh, trending tags once Zane's feature is done or, or maybe something different. So yeah, in addition to the changes that Thomas made, curious what everybody thinks about this section right here. I mean, right now, none of the trending, at least for me, ever seems to update very frequently. So I always end up seeing the same stuff regardless. So I don't have any strong attachment to it right now. Yeah, that makes no sense. Ricardo, did you have a hand? Oh, uh, yeah, the same. I was, I was about to say the same. Like, they're always the same. So, yeah, I second that. Yeah. Yeah, Nick. So you proposed we talk about the. the hub. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. So I um, appreciate us, you know, discussing this. Um, yeah. First off, I think the, the the trending hubs part isn't for me. It also doesn't really change too often. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if I just had a few comments possibly about the new layout, if we wanted to. But if Patrick, you still wanted to talk about the the trending hubs part, we could. No, this sounds great. That's uh, I think people confirmed what we were thinking. So yeah, we'd love to talk about the new layout. Okay. Okay. Cool. So I I like the idea of having more info um, available. I just think maybe a couple tweaks. Just wanted to get your guys' thoughts. So um, the when it lists what hub a poster is or a, a paper is posted in, I find that really useful because I can see okay if it's chemistry and biology and I like biochemistry, I'm like okay that might be um, good to see. So where it's it right now it's collapsed where it's just just one hub and then it says plus two or plus one. Um, there's a whole lot of real estate there. So I think maybe listing those out um, completely might be a little more a little more useful as far as kind of showing that. Um, and then <clears throat> possibly making the the comments a little bit more easy to see that a paper does have a lot of comments because before I did really like that blue bubble. But right now it's kind of it's it's a little difficult to see you know, you could have two papers, one with 10 comments and one with none, and it wouldn't really leap off the page as a lot more activity on one um, versus the other. So just, just some thoughts on that. Yeah, we've actually gotten like that exact, like both of those points uh, have been brought up before. So yeah, that's great feedback. And we'll definitely keep that in mind when we're doing like the next design iteration on it. I'm curious what other prototypes you considered when you were talking about the list of the hubs, because one one potential implication is that I have never before considered which hub I enter for the paper first, right? And they're kind of all equal in my head, but now it's really important, right? Because this is the only hub that's fully displayed while all others are, you know, plus, plus more. Yeah, that's true. And the things that that's an intended, or so this like this design was sort of intended um just because we, we kind of keep this layout uh all the way to like 900 ish pixels so like if you sort of make uh this window like a bit less wide 
like uh, there's there's a point where it's like if you if you showed more than one hub it would like really mess up the mm. the, the way like uh yeah the layout do you think it would be it would make sense to supplement this decision then in the submission flow so for example maybe make it explicit for users that uh submit the primary hub and then submit the secondary hubs or something like that i think it's just like a little bit more work but we can basically adjust it so that like uh it uses up like more of the white space pretty much so like it's sort of it's like a bit more work engineering wise but we can sort of make it more dynamic there so like it, sh it always shows as much as it can before collapsing Edwin? I was wondering, are you guys working on um, uh, how you decide what's trending or even what's showing up in the newest action? I'm not sure it's just something that's a problem for a larger hub, but in the law hub, for example, I just posted a paper, and if I click on newest, I wouldn't see my paper. Uh, I was just wondering if there's um, just with, like how you guys figure out what's trending, what's not, etc. If that's something that's a problem for everyone, or if it's something that you guys are, you know, paying particular attention to, etc. Yeah. So we actually, uh, Kobe, last week uh, created a new hot score for the uh, trending filter. Um, we're like monitoring it right now. Um, I think anybody can take a look if you want. I'll ping Kobe afterwards to get. It's like you can add like a extension to this URL and be able to see from the new hot score. Um, we're not like totally happy with it though. So we're going to tweak it a little bit this week and hopefully release it by the end of the week. Um, but yeah, I've, I've also noticed that newest is not the newest. Um, and also like some of these filters don't work. Like if you go like top from this week or this month, um, they're not always right. So yeah, we definitely need to debug these new filters. I think these were added um, like halfway through last week. So yeah, there's probably gonna be a little bit of iteration when it comes to making sure they're working properly. But um, Edwin, I will, after the call, uh, find Kobe's URL that he has for the new hot score and send it to you to see if you think it's an improvement. Okay, cool. Other thoughts on the visual layout? Um, something we kind of wanted your, everyone's opinion on. Right now, we're showing like the date that the paper was uploaded, but other sites like Reddit typically show sort of like how long ago the post was made. So like instead of saying like March fourth, it would say like you know one day ago or something like that, one week ago. We wanted to get everyone's thoughts on if that's more useful information. Yeah, I would I really like don't more. have a preference. Go, sorry, go ahead. Nick? Um, I just, this is just my opinion, but in this space, I think having the, the actual date it was posted is, um, is most useful to me, just because then it's kind of easier to know. Because when you're looking at papers, they're all, they all show the date that they were published and everything. So we're kind of already thinking in that way about it. So. I mean, for me, I would I would vote the date showing um, is most helpful versus the other one. Okay. This might just be me too, Thomas, but I, I feel like uh, these icons um, are a little bit extra and they feel like make it busier than it needs to be. Like if we move the paper icon up here back to where it was, I'm not sure if that was in our comments from Friday, but um, yeah, like the, this calendar icon and this like comments bubble. Um, not sure if anybody else feels the same way. Yeah, we can we could try like a version without it, uh, without icons there for sure. Ricardo. We are we planning? Uh, I don't know. Maybe in the future to have a feature that uh, differentiates between uh, review papers and research papers and have that an icon that, you know, can easily, you know, that users can easily discriminate between the two. No, it's not a big deal, but could be actually pretty, pretty useful. I think long-term that would be incredibly useful. E even just having like 
randomized controlled trial versus like uh you know retrospective cohort study or something like that like to have the type of study um to allow you to filter by that i know like pubmed and most academic search engines do that so i could see it down the road being pretty useful um yeah and then even we got a uh, comment on twitter um from the person who made the unofficial research hub commercial which is awesome who uh, wants us to filter by open access versus not open access papers too. So in theory, like if you wanted to consume the feed and only have open access like posts, so that way you'd be able to actually read the papers, um, you'd be able to do that without getting excited about a title and then clicking into it and realizing it's behind a paywall. So yeah, I, personally, I think that would be a great filter too, to be able to filter by uh, the license type. And that I wonder if, yeah, oh, sorry. Go yeah, go on. I wonder if it makes sense to expand the idea with the tags to help with this. So, for example, in addition to regular tags that users can add, you could have kind of like staple tags that are mutually exclusive, right? So you can submit a paper and you can select one of three tags. It's either an empirical paper or, or not free, maybe a secondary analysis, review, meta-analysis. You know, so instead of instead of creating a category in the filter, they would kind of be created somewhere on the back end instead. And so you could have different tags similar to that that are also mutually exclusive. You know, something like if, if it's open access uh, status, it could be, you know, open access, non-open access could be, you know, pre-registered, registered report, no pre-registration or something like that, you know yeah totally so i think uh i think the way the tags are being built this could be done so we can definitely experiment with it and see like kind of how it works and if it if we find it useful um i know one thing which is hard is like uh some of the metadata around papers are not perfect so trying to extract the license type uh only some papers actually have that included in the metadata so we'd have to do some like manual tagging and then have some kind of like quality control on that tagging um I know for like actual papers themselves too, sometimes they have in the metadata, like uh, what type of paper it is, whether it's a RCT or like case study or something like that. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll probably have to, I think in general, there seems to be a lot of value within like um, creating RC bounties for mechanical Turk style work where you don't necessarily have to be an expert uh, academic, but you can come in and say, yeah, this is a, this is definitely a randomized control tile. I'll add the tag, get my RSC, move on to the next paper. So we'll probably explore that at some point over the next six months or so. But yeah, so so long-winded answer of, we can definitely take the tagging feature that Zane's building and um, kind of apply it in many different directions. And if it seems useful, if people are doing it manually, it seems useful, build some tooling around it to make it a little bit more automated. This, this seems like a great idea. Also, because again, thinking about the competitors like if you look at science science direct they have that kind of feature where you can discriminate between review and research articles but it's not great like some articles are tagged as reviews but they're actually research articles so in this way like a community powered kind of like uh let's say quality control i think could be really really uh useful uh, in the future so yeah yeah we've talked about this a little bit before and this could be like a kind of long-term goal but having like a a database of accurate metadata because i know like when you upload papers to mendeley or something like that it doesn't always pull like the author information or like the funding information like if we could create a database that has all of that um yeah i think it'd be really useful to a lot of people so it'd be cool to be able to use the token to leverage like anyone out there who wants to help to do some of that manual labor Cool. Yeah, does anybody right. have any thoughts? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm always uh, always uh, talking, but uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you something about the, the hubs. Like, you know, the, the hubs uh, main page? Uh, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the added value of that little description? Because in most cases, it's really like uh, not that um, indicative of the field and could actually be kind of like misleading. So I'm, I'm kind of like wondering, I was wondering what is the added value of having that? It, it could also like help like condensing the, 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 the little, like the figures of the, of the hubs. So, yeah. 
It's a great question. So I don't think we, we haven't put a lot of like critical design thinking into like our hubs page uh, since Thomas built that for his work trial. I like the descriptions like when you click into a hub, how it's like on the home page, you have like immunology and then members and then the editors and like a description. But I think you're right that in like the hubs home page itself, um, it, they aren't totally necessary and and most people like kind of know what oncology is you know i'm not sure if like the study of cancer is 100 percent necessary uh to help draw in a new person um so yeah it's, it's a great point and we could probably uh save some real estate there and include more hubs like above the fold on the hubs page all right let's move on uh patrick are, are you okay with presenting the tokenomics update uh yeah definitely sorry i gotta let my dog outside really quick she's she's whining so just give me one second sure okay cool i'm back um yeah so let me pull this up and present this so this is um basically like a overview of research hubs tokenomics that was published over the weekend this is something that we've been kind of like playing around with for like six months or so. So it's a little bit different than uh, what's in the white paper. So just wanted to kind of like uh, quickly overview it with everyone and help to answer any like uh, thoughts, questions about it. Um, Brian on Friday actually like uh, published a personal blog um, uh, disclosing his involvement in Research Hub and linked this because uh, we just finalized it over the weekend. So yeah, this is kind of like the the tokenomics overview that helped to explain sort of like the the economy supply demand that'll come out of research coin. Uh, the idea is we're starting with a billion total tokens. Um, about uh, three percent of the supply is circulating right now, so that's like in people's Ethereum wallets or uh, in their research hub app accounts. It's actually slightly higher than this, but it's near three percent. Um, we plan to add a. Uh, uh, 5% of RC per year to be distributed either through rewards on the app or for performing services for the community. Um, for instance, like completing bounties to post uh, papers on Twitter or something like that. Uh, here's the smart contract address. If anybody wants to go on Etherscan, look it up. This is stuff everybody knows here, um, just overviews of uh, Research Hub and Research Coin. Um, and so this is the important information here. Uh, these are the three buckets that the initial 1 billion tokens are uh, divvied up into. And kind of the thought process here um, is a lot of DAOs kind of exist in this sort of like flat democratic structure where people um, like earn tokens and then like have a higher standing in the community. And so um, these are like really powerful models, at least in our estimation, for things like funding uh, like um, grants or like investing. So getting a bunch of people together, like pooling capital and making like simple decisions around how that capital is allocated. But in general, uh, we think that like DAOs are not great um, like decision-making structures for building products. Um, in general, uh, Brian's a huge fan of like founder-led companies. Uh, if you look at like the the stock market like a lot of the biggest tech companies that have been able to be successful still have like initial founders essentially as ceos or controlling the board and sometimes like when investment money uh can overtake like a founder's controlling share um the company doesn't do as well long term because uh, a lot of decisions are made basically like to maximize profits and not necessarily to accomplish a mission that a founder started so um with that like concept of founder led companies, the way that we're thinking about this is the initial supply is divvied up into three buckets, 60% uh, for the founding team, 20% for the uh, community and users of Research Hub, and then 20% for future employees of uh, Research Hub technologies to help us hire to essentially like build out the ecosystem. Um, this is kind of like a standard Silicon Valley type of distribution for like a equity. Um, uh, raise so in theory like if you go do like y combinator like the founders start out with a hundred percent um they give seven percent to y combinator then they do a seed round where they normally distribute about like 20 percent and then uh, series a where they distribute about 20 percent and so brian's thinking of research hub in a similar fashion 
except we'll never need to raise money. And instead of raising money, essentially what we'll do is um, dilute these buckets by minting new tokens to distribute to the community and future employees of Research Hub. So at 5% per year being distributed uh, basically to users via the app and uh, performing services for the community, this pool will run out in about four years, at which point we'll host a, like a community vote in order to mint new tokens. And so the way that we see this working like into the future is essentially whenever any of these buckets run out, um, we'll hold a vote to mint new tokens, uh, replenish it for a like predetermined period of time and then, um, yeah, it gives us flexibility to essentially like uh, make decisions on the fly uh, as a community to make sure like each one of these buckets are like appropriately um, funded with research coin. And then one other thing is in the future, like we may say um, it would be nice if there was a certain bucket for like funding projects on Research Hub. And maybe we want to have like votes uh, to help like determine how this capital is allocated if we decide to make a pool for funding different projects. Um, and at that point, it would be the same procedure. Like there'd be a community vote where we'd say, hey, we want a new bucket uh, outside of these three. Here's what it's for. Uh, here's how many tokens we want to allocate to it or mint new tokens to put into it. And uh, here's like uh, essentially like how long it will last. So lots of information here. Um, does anybody have any thoughts or questions about how these tokenomics are kind of uh, like laid out initially? And then also kind of like our plan long term of diluting all of these shares by minting new tokens to either like distribute for the community or future employees? I can't see anybody. Any thoughts? Okay, cool. Yeah, if nobody has any thoughts, no big deal. Um, so uh, another thing that we kind of decided on Friday too is um, for community voting, um, we plan to have a board seat for Research Hub Inc. that's essentially voted on by the community um, and has regular terms. So that'll either be like quarterly or yearly or something like that where um, somebody, uh, whoever is like nominated by the community um, can be voted to hold a board seat in Research Hub Inc, like attend our board meetings, help to like uh, kind of like set direction for the project. Um, and so that board seat will be determined by community voting, uh, probably without Brian and I uh, voting within it or anybody from the Research Hub team. So that's also like a added addition to help like the community essentially like have like a, a governing say over how Research Hub Technologies Inc. operates in the future. Yeah, Malik. Uh, sorry, uh, going back to the tokenomics part, a quick question, like a couple of friends have asked if they wanna get um, research going uh, right now, is there any other way except over the counter, like through the Uniswap that do you foresee that happening soon or? Uh, I think like the the number one way we want people to earn research coin is by contributing to the community. So like either being an editor or like completing bounties. I, I know like um, for instance, uh, Jeff has a friend who is like uh, he manages social media for a couple of like big companies. And so Jeff introduced me to him on Sunday, and this person you know has like a lot of value they could potentially bring to Research Hub. So he's gonna chip in, you know, kind of like. Uh, very part time in order to help us organize kind of our social media outreach. And so that person will end up earning some coins for that effort because it's like incredibly valuable to us at the moment. So, yeah, I think um, I, I think in the future, there probably will be ways um, that people can exchange financial value for research coin. But right now, the most important one is actually contributing to the community. So posting papers, being an editor, or like doing other kind of business operations oriented tasks. And if you know anybody who's interested in that, like I'd be happy to chat with them and kind of like see if there are any good fits. So yeah, definitely if you know anybody, uh, DM me and happy to jump on a call to see like uh, where it might make sense. Thanks. Yeah, yeah definitely.
Any other thoughts here before we uh, move on? Cool. Yeah. It's a lot of information. So yeah. we'll, pro we'll probably think more about it. I, I wonder, is, is do you think is there any lower and upper limits on how many tokens will be minted and you know what if community goes crazy all of us and like we want to mint 50 billion for the next quarter would there be some some boundaries there yeah so, so that's why um the team allocation is so high at the beginning is it allows essentially like the research hub team to help put guardrails on this process and so yeah essentially um like for the first probably like four or five years when it comes to minting new tokens, um, like Brian and I's share of voting will probably likely be able to unilaterally, like with our two votes combined, make decisions. But the idea here is like over the course of like 10 to 20 years, this power ends up becoming diluted. And we kind of anticipate basically being able to set a culture where like once you're once you're 10 years into a project, most of the people who hold the most tokens have long-term you know thinking and it wouldn't make sense to just like mint a bunch of tokens put them all in my wallet and destroy the value of like the economy so th those things are bigger risks at the early stages of a project which is why we kind of have this like founder controlled mentality which will eventually be diluted over time okay uh be being uh, RSC starting as a fixed supply. Uh, do you see any risk in making it like inflationary with this, you know, possibility to mint uh, new tokens after basically the two uh, the two uh, buckets for community and future employees uh, basically are uh, become empty? So to to repeat that back, are you saying like uh, like risks in general, or do you think like uh... There's yeah, potential potential drawbacks so have, of having that not fixed anymore. Because once it's fixed, like the community knows that there's a certain amount, but like now you're basically saying that actually, you know, like uh, many more tokens can be minted. So uh, is that gonna change anything? Like just like wondering if you think that there's uh, something I can actually, you know, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I think like from from a purely like if I were to speculate um perspective actually two thought processes here uh the first is like fixed supply is good because then you know like more supply won't come onto the marketplace and uh you know reduce the price without changing demand right just that curve um so so like first level thought is fixed supply is good um second level thought is like if you're speculating over the long-term value of the project like you want the project to be able to succeed. And so a lot of times, like um, I think crypto projects sort of do a lot of um, planning in an a priori fashion where yeah. it's just really difficult to get stuff right. Like it's it's gonna be like the legal situation around all this stuff is gonna be wildly different in four years by the time we actually mint new tokens. And so it's uh, it's just extremely difficult to predict like the, like best way to handle these type of like big picture economic decisions. So um, the nice part about this is it gives us a little bit of flexibility. So um, essentially we're able to like make decisions on the fly with up-to-date information. And so uh, like personally, I think that this is like a, a much safer way of kind of doing things than having a fixed supply, um, especially, and I'm biased, right? Cause I trust me and I trust Brian, but, um, especially with like uh, having some kind of like, like I've been working on a project like this for, you know, like five years. So like I'm here for the long term and Brian's here for the long term and like having like long term thinking, make those decisions initially, I think is is almost safer um, than trying to like predict what the world's going to look like in five, 10, 15 years. So, yeah, we, we think this is the ability to essentially stay on our toes a little bit better and like it doesn't necessarily preclude the possibility of in the future once we have like a pretty good understanding of what's working and what's not working um creating something more like set in stone and written code like i know some projects have like uh, inflation schedules that are essentially guaranteed and so this this is like that it just gives us the ability to 
um, pivot. For instance, like we have 20% in the employee pool. It's unclear how long that would last. Like if we like, like get a bajillion users in the next two months and we have to like build out our engineering team and hire a hundred engineers over the next six months, like it'll probably get depleted quicker than if things maybe take a little longer. So yeah, not allowing us to decide when to mint um, gives us like a ton of flexibility uh, in order to make the best decisions in the moment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. That was, that was basically it. Yeah. It was more uh, like a kind of like wanted to be safe, like having more coins on the market, like mostly on the market, like people that just want to speculate and is not really invested in the long term. So having more coins out, maybe, you know, just like uh, includes more, more risks, but uh, yeah, I totally, um, yeah, I totally mirror your uh, perspective actually on this, having more flexibility for a project like this is uh, really important to be able to live it in the future. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, cool. If anybody has any thoughts uh, in the future, happy to chat about this on a call because I think getting the stuff and even like the messaging around it is pretty important. So yeah, definitely like uh, pretty interested to hear what people think. So feel free to DM me and like would be glad to jump on a call and talk about it. Shall we talk about the signing options in the time remaining? Yeah, that sounds great. So this is uh, another, I think like, uh, community requested feature that has been around for a while is um, people don't love having Google sign in be the only option. We've done this for basically like convenience purposes. Um, it's like really low weight engineering wise and allows us to not have to do any security around like managing people's personal information, like their passwords and email addresses and stuff. Um, Google is in a better position to do it than us. But we're at the point where we think it makes sense to um, start to open this up a little bit. So we're going to, and I think like part of this is brought about because um, some people have tried to like use Research Hub to like share new papers and stuff and they're unable to log in or unable to sign up. And so that's like a pretty big blocker at the top of the funnel when it comes to like increasing our uh, North Star metric of weekly active contributors. So yeah, we wanna make sure that anybody who wants to be able to contribute to Research Hub isn't getting blocked by like a technical difficulty. So um, what we plan to do is essentially, like a lot of people who are tech savvy, um, they disable third-party cookies like within their browser. Um, this, you're, you're unable to sign into Research Hub currently if your third-party cookies are disabled. And so um, we're tweaking the Google sign-in so that way that will not become necessary. So if you're in incognito mode or something like that, like you can still sign into Research Hub or if you have like ad blockers, like really powerful ones. Um, and then in, in addition to that, like we also want to um, have another type of sign in. So um, some things that other people use are like Twitter or GitHub or Orchid is like a science specific one. Um, or uh, there's been like projects that are doing sign in with Ethereum wallets. So like you'd be able to just sign in with your like uh, MetaMask and then you'd have a user account associated with whatever your like wallets, um, you know, like string of characters is. So yeah, does anybody have any requests when it comes to like uh, different logins um, that in theory would help to make it easier for new people who come to Research Hub, making sure that anybody who wants to post will be able to. I guess like a specific pointed question here is um, would anyone sign in with Ethereum wallets if that was an option? Is that interesting to people here whatsoever? Yeah, I would. I, I think some people um, would, would prefer that. That would allow like anonymous uh, comments as well. Um, and uh, I think as we, as we look into this, uh, I think we had discussed this at one of the previous community calls is if let's say the community grows really big and there are some like, I don't know, for the lack of word, like gods in the field who are like 200 papers and they have posted something and somebody is like afraid of commenting, then it would give them the confidence of having the anonymous comment and still get uh, both knowledge as well as like whatever contribution they get in research point from that. So yeah, I like the idea of signing through the wallet yeah 
Yeah, it's a great point. We've even thought about anonymous commenting being something where like if you hold enough research coin in your wallet, then that unlocks. So the idea being like if you're new to Research Hub, then you have to say who you are. But if you've kind of demonstrated that you're uh, you know, interested in like maintaining quality and contributing quality, then we can trust you with anonymity or anonymity to be able to criticize others in a productive fashion. Cool. So, so I guess when it comes to like uh, outside of Google, like uh, log in with Facebook. Anybody want that? <laughs> Is that joking? Um, so, so Twitter, GitHub. Orchid, any other ones that we should potentially consider? Or, or is this not even like a big deal to anybody here? Like, is everybody happy with the Google sign in? Scott mentioned Twitter. Yeah, Twitter, Twitter's a good one. Um, Twitter's definitely an option. I'm not sure. One thing is like, I don't know if like every academic has Twitter. Um, like same thing with Orchid though. So we're, we're gonna run into issues no matter what here, um, unless we just wanna do like a bespoke sign-in where you can do your own email address and password. Wouldn't that introduce like whatever service you would like to tie as a sign-in system to Research Hub, that potentially could be the weakest link, right? Because so much, because you could hold actual funds in Research Hub then Let's say, I don't know how good the protection of Orchid is, but what if it's easier to hack compared to, I don't know, a Twitter or Google sign in? Wouldn't that just introduce more problems? Yeah, totally. So, so we have stuff we can do to protect it. Like if you logged in with Twitter recently, like uh, it, we can put like delays on withdrawing where you have to confirm from your previous email that this is you withdrawing or something like that. Like there, there are things we can do to help uh, mitigate that risk. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a great point. I, I think you're right that Orchid probably isn't the most well-developed when it comes to like security. So that, that would make a ton of sense. I'm sure something like uh, GitHub or Twitter, you know, has, they have much bigger budgets when it comes to like actually protecting login info. So yeah, totally, it's a great point. Ethereum should solve that though, because the sign in with Ethereum, you're the only person with your private key. So that's a nice little uh, added benefit. But then also a lot of scientists don't have Ethereum wallets. So we'd, we'd have to help them spin something up easily if they wanted to. Cool. Yeah. Does anybody have any other thoughts here? I think that's all we have, Anton, right? Any other topics? Nope, that's it for now. OK, cool. Yeah, so a, a couple of other random uh, administrative notes. Um, so we're going to be hosting an AMA uh, with another DSI project founder who wrote a paper about um, like DSI and science and how blockchain can help. Um, it was a preprint. I posted it late last week. So um, we'll try and get like a bunch of comments on this paper and then like share it around the internet and the authors are gonna come in and do an interview. And so we'll be able to essentially like do like a, a live YouTube with all the authors answering the questions that are listed like in the forum and then also anything that pops up live. Um, so that'll be exciting. And then um, uh, we also have like a, some marketing stuff coming up. So um, Wafa and uh, Ricardo are gonna be like holding some meetings on like how to um, essentially like post to Reddit and like post to Facebook groups to help uh, do some of this stuff. And for the first AMA, I'll be doing the whole process live. So uh, essentially like I'll share how I recruited these people. Um, once we have like a date and time set, um, how I shared around to different like uh, online communities in order to get attendees, that kind of thing. So um, we'll be hosting uh, basically like half hour calls, a couple over the next few weeks in order to anybody who's interested can show up and kind of like learn how to host these sort of events on your own. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, and yeah, thanks for sharing such good feedback for Zane. Uh, excited for um, him to potentially start joining the team. So yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
See you next week. Bye, Bye everyone.